Gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you once again for the opportunity that you've given us to study together, to feast upon your word. I understand how difficult it is, how keenly aware that we are of just how infinite your word is and how limited our understanding is. I just thank you, dear Lord, that we do indeed have eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that when we sin, it is not we who sins, but sin which dwells in us. Dear Lord, help us not to judge one another in regard to that. Show us the truth of thy word. Filter out any foolishness, any ignorance, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at Blessed Hope Forever. Dot com and I want to address a subject that is probably arguably could be the single most difficult passage in all the Bible and, I, and the reason I say that is because it's been argued so uh, widely uh, since the text was written there, and because of the diversity of opinions that there are regarding the interpretation of this. So I'm going to take a, just a, a brief detour here uh, from uh, our present study in the Epistle to the Colossians, and I want to talk about the, the subject of uh, sin unto death, well, which we see in 1 John chapter 5, verse uh, 16 and 17. Before I do this, I want to just begin by reading a little bit out of Hebrews chapter 6, starting at verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. I want you to... Uh, I want you to take special note of that, eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing that they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh off often upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receives blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak." For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Now, I'm not going to to take the time to go over all of the varied interpretations of, of this passage in 1 John chapter 5 regarding the sin unto death. Neither am I going to suggest to you that I know the right one. I'm simply going to go through this as a student of God's Word, and it's up, up to you to decide. Now, I could list at least 10 different approaches to this verse. I believe verse 16 should be understood in light of the entire chapter, context, 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 folks. Anytime we look at any particular verse or any particular passage, we need to look at what was said before it and what was said after it. The death that is involved here, I believe, in this passage is spiritual death, not physical death. And the life that, that's in this verse is spiritual life. 
it is it is absolutely clear the, uh, there's an abundance of scripture that comes to bear that could substantiate the point beyond a shadow of a doubt that the sins that you and I commit as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ do not lead to spiritual death. Whereas the sin that a non-believer commits does. And I believe that's what we're looking at in this text. Now, some people use this uh, scripture to suggest that there are occasions where God takes his people home because they stubbornly persist in some sin or they're trapped in some sin uh, that they can't get out of until he finally takes them home. So that so they they're basically what what's going on is is that they they are dying a physical death, a sin unto physical death. Now, I'm simply going to tell you what I think this means, and, and it's up to you to search the Scriptures to see whether or not these things be so. Uh, if you follow this channel for any length of time, you know that, uh, f for the most part, quite often I'll be very dogmatic about what I preach and about what I teach. I intend to, to stay the course and be just as dogmatic about what I, I believe the text is saying here. But as far as the overall interpretation, the conclusion is, if, if you will, of this, I'm not going to, I want to take just a little bit of a step back, tiny baby step back, and not be just as quite as dogmatic about this as I normally would. And that's because it is such a controversial passage of Scripture. But I do believe that by looking at closely at the text and following the, the general rules of interpretation, I think that by doing so, uh, a picture will begin to form as to what's go really going on here. Now, first of all, I want to say that I don't believe that there was any break between verse 16 and that which preceded this, uh, that which preceded, which was that we were asking God according to His will. So I don't believe that there's any break there. I'm absolutely persuaded it, it cannot be physical death and physical life, but that it's spiritual death and spiritual life. I believe the entire context of the the uh, the context of the entire chapter bears this out. In this epistle, chapter two, verse sixteen, John uses the word bios for physical life. In chapter 3, verse 16, he uses a word, another word for physical life, but, but in our preceding verses, we see that God has given us eternal life. And if any man sees his brother sinning a sin not unto death, if any man sees, the word see, the, uh, the word is an aorist, it isn't that he constantly sees this individual. There isn't any indication in the text that somebody is is persisting in some kind of sin that is continuing to go on. He sees his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, not unto spiritual death. Now, folks, listen to me very carefully. Every single one of us sins, sins not unto death. Every single one of us, without exception, is involved in sinning that is not unto spiritual death. When we get to verse 18, we'll, we'll read that we know that whosoever is born of God doesn't sin. So apparently this brother is a true brother born of God. And I want you to take serious note of the fact that he's called a brother. Okay, he's not called a professing brother or one who believes, who claims to be a brother, as we'll see in a, in a particular passage of Scripture that I'll point to uh, here uh, just a little bit later. Here is somebody who is seeing his brother committing a sin, which is not a sin toward spiritual death. I believe that we also need to take note of the personal pronouns. I'm just reading Greek, and my Greek says that the guy who sees this guy do this, 
okay? It, there's a question in my mind as to whether God is giving the guy that is sinning life or the one that is going to God and praying concerning his brother that he sees that he may be given life. Okay. I'm tempted to, to not believe that the, the text is saying uh, that, that God gives life to the guy uh, that sees his brother sinning the sin unto death. It, it seems to be almost certain that God is giving life to the guy who's the brother who is sinning not unto death. It says, I believe that he gives life to the one who is sinning a, a sin that is not unto death. But he's called a brother. But I want you to, to take note of the fact that it, it doesn't say eternal life. It just says life. There are hordes of Christians, I've pointed this out in the past before, who see other Christians sinning and they are just devastated over that. So if you want to take and go that direction in which you might consider, at least consider the fact that the one who is, that God's giving life to is the one who is doing the seeing, not the sinning, I'm going to leave that up to you to, to decide that. But when we're told that we are dead to sin, that it's not we who sins, but sin which dwells in us, that we are to reckon ourselves daily dead to sin, that his seed remains in us and we cannot sin, that is the new man cannot sin because his seed abides in us. It could be that we need some spiritual understanding when we deal with our brother in this context. We are all in a body of death. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. We have a body of death. We have this treasure in an earthen vessel. There's that Romans 7 conflict. That what I, I want to do, I don't do. I do the very thing that I don't want to do. What I don't want to do, that's the very thing that I do. That's where we're going to go in the 18th verse. Is the text saying that he's, this brother is asking God to intervene in that brother's life to where that he's involved in a sin that's not unto death, but he doesn't, he doesn't have the confidence that he has eternal life. And so therefore, God is, is going to give him that confidence that he has eternal life, which is the overall context of the chapter the fifth chapter of 1 John. That's really the direction I'm leaning in all of this. That's, I, I'm looking at the brother who is, who, is, who is seeing his brother, the one who is doing the seeing, as the, one, as the more mature brother who understands it's not he who sins, but sin which dwells in him. And he's praying to God on behalf of the one that he sees who is sinning a sin that's not unto death, but this, this person who's doing the sinning does not understand what the mature brother, the one that's doing the seeing, understands. And that is, it is not we who sins, but sin which dwells in us. So there's no confidence. There's no certain solid confidence on the part of the one doing the sinning that he has the eternal life that John is so focused on in this chapter. So is the text saying that he's asking God to intervene in that brother's life or is he asking God to understand what's going on and God gives him an understanding of, it, of eternal life? The, the fact of the matter, folks, is that the chapter immerses us in the reality of eternal life. I believe the text is a strong urging to pray where that our brother that we see sinning a sin, not unto death, receives understanding that is life, that he has this treasure in earthen vessels, that his old man does nothing but sin, that that's all that the old man does, 
that portion of him which is born of God, which cannot sin. We know a corrupt tree brings forth bad fruit. You know, the old man, a good tree brings forth good fruit. That's the new man. That portion of you, which is a new creation in Christ, which is the new man. I want you to imagine the new man created in righteousness and true holiness sinning. Well, the, the fact of the matter is it doesn't. Oh, he sins some of the time, but he doesn't habitually sin. And now, and now we have multitudes going out saying, you know, boy, I, I, I habitually sin, so maybe I'm not saved. Maybe I'm not redeemed. Maybe I'm not justified. Maybe I really, truly don't belong to Christ. Maybe Jesus Christ didn't die in my place. And we load people up. We heap guilt upon them. Guilt that I believe that the Holy Spirit never intended that we bear. I believe the word is a word of comfort, of confidence. We know, too, from the context, what is, was said prior to our passage dealing with the sin not unto death, that we have confidence that whatever we ask, we'll receive from the Lord. This is the confidence that we have in Him, my text says. That's a third-class condition. Maybe He will, maybe He won't. But, but He sees a brother sinning, which is not toward death. I reach the conclusion that we as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we, we have some reason to distinguish between sins that are not toward death and sins that are toward death. In addition, I don't believe that the brother, I think it's important to take note that, that we don't see a mention of the brother in the last half of the verse, folks. He's only mentioned in the first half. What, it, what this implies is that you, you as Christians who submit yourself to the Lord and you pray and you ask concerning this brother, that your concern for him is, is that he come to understand that, that he, he's, the sin that he's sinning, which is not unto death, is not going to take and separate him from God. That's what we'll see as we continue on past this past, this, these verses on into the, the last part or the latter part of the chapter. So there are sins that are not unto death and there are sins that are unto death. One's a brother that's sinning not unto death. One is not. There is sin that leads toward death and we know that. I believe the text says we know that. And I do not say that you should pray for that. That's, that's a different word now for pray. Actually, uh, if I could go to some of my notes here, I want to point out the fact that the first, one of the rules of interpretation is when we look at a word, we want to look at the first occurrence of that word. Where that the text, our, our actual text in, in 1 John 5.18, or 5.17, I'm sorry. 1 John 5.17 It says that, or maybe I'm looking at verse 16, 1 John 5, 16, the latter part of that verse. There is a sin unto death. Not concerning that do I say that he should implore. The word is, is a different word than the word ask at the beginning uh, of this verse. And that word, the first occurrence of that, we find that in Matthew 15, were that there was a Canaanite woman uh, from that region came to Christ crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is miserably possessed by a demon. But Jesus did not answer a word. Jesus was silent. He didn't have anything to say. Same word. The silence of Jesus there in this passage in Matthew chapter 15 verse 23 
him not saying anything. We see the same word here in our study uh, here in 1 John 5.16. Not concerning that do I say he should implore. In other words, just total silence. Going back to Matthew 15 again, the, the passage uh, or the uh, verse 24, Matthew 15, 24 says that, that uh, so his disciples came and urged him, send her away for she keeps crying out after us. And what did Jesus say? He said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now I find that interesting because when I go over to Romans chapter 6, verse th 13, or I'm sorry, if, if I go to 1 Corinthians 5.12, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12, we hear Paul say, What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? Do at least in my mind, in my understanding, folks, I'm seeing a connection between what Paul just said here about us not judging those who are outside, but judging those who are inside. And that's not judgment as far as judging them whether or not they're a believer or not. Or It's, it's making a, a, a righteous judgment concerning uh, that, that person. We're not to judge those outside the church. I, I see a connection between this and 1 Corinthians 5.12 in our passage here in 1 John 5.16 that there is a sin unto death not concerning that. Do I, do I say that he should implore? As it concerns the sin unto death, we're not looking at a brother. We're looking at someone in whom we have nothing to say to God concerning that person. Now, I know that flies in the face of modern evangelism. But it is not our place to take and, and judge those who are in a position of sinning unto death, is what I'm trying to say. We have, we're not to pray that God would give them life in the same sense that we're asking God to give life to those who are our brother who, who is sinning not unto death. That's, that's where the, I start to get a, the picture starts to emerge, at least in my mind, concerning this. Now we know that, that he, he uses the word life, not eternal life. And of course, and I believe that there is a distinction between, I think it's important to note that the Holy Spirit didn't say that he would give this brother of ours eternal life. He already has eternal life. He says he won't that he will give him life. If we go over to 2 Peter 1.3, we see Peter saying that his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. So his divine power, God's divine power, has given us, those who have eternal life, everything we need for life and godliness. The word zoe in the Greek, it's, it means the quality of life. I don't believe that the, that the brother that is sinning not unto death, that if, if I look out here and I see you sinning a sin that's not unto death because you're my brother and I know that you're going to heaven, you're not, that sin is not going to, to, to put you in hell. But you don't quite have the understanding that that's not you who, who sins, but sin which dwells in you. That the new man cannot sin. That, 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 that the sinning there, and, and I remind you folks once again, there is not a single one of us, not a one, that is not sinning, sin that is not unto death. Every sin we commit is a sin that is not unto death. If if that makes any sense. I have to admit, this is a very, very tough, tough passage. And there are many, uh, I, I suppose I've read at least 10 interpretations of this passage. 
it wasn't too long ago, in fact, that I believed that this was physical death, not spiritual death, that this was a brother. We saw them, that we were looking at the brother in the last part of the, of the, the passage who was sinning unto death, physical death. This was a brother that the Lord took home because he was involved in sin. And the Lord, out of love and, and mercy, took him home to end his suffering of, of being out of fellowship with God and persisting in sin. That's what I used to believe. I no, lo I no longer believe that. I, I'm, I am no longer able to hold to that position after having looked at more seriously at the text and looking in, in, in particular, taking important note of the context, the overall context, the personal pronouns, the difference between the singular and the plural, Uh, just con taking all of it into consideration, the meanings of the words, the difference between the word ask in, in the first part of the passage and implore in the latter part of the passage. The fact that the brother is not mentioned in the second part of the passage. The brother that we see sinning not unto death is one whose sins have been covered by Jesus Christ. I believe the text is saying that as I pray about this brother, that God is telling me that that's a brother in Christ. That's what the text says to me. It doesn't say that the Lord is giving me life, but He's giving that brother life that is involved in that sinning that's not toward death. And probably because He's not confident and assured that he has the eternal life that the Apostle John has made clear in the overall context of the fifth chapter of, this, of his first epistle. The Lord's going to say to me, Steve, this is a brother that is, he's not a, one who professes to be a brother, he's a brother a true brother in the Lord. And, and he's to be distinguished from the one who is sinning unto death who is not a brother in the Lord. I ask the Lord to give life to that brother. He's a brother in the Lord. And I believe that I can have the confidence that God will answer that prayer. I think that's what the answer is. God shall give him life, singular, okay, for them who are sinning, unto death that's there we see it's, it changes to plural so it's it's regarding anyone that we see who is sinning a sin that is not unto death these are our brothers in Christ so once again i believe that the grammar argues that that the one that is asking is concerned about the brother's relationship as as it his discernment as it regards that sin in his life or that he's, he's sinning, a sin that is not unto death, but it is, he needs to understand that that's not him who sins, but sin which dwells in him. The guy that is sinning is already our brother. He already has spiritual life, but he doesn't have the quality of life and understanding that that's not he who sins, but sin which dwells in him. There are uh, some people committing sins. However, the, the, apparently the text says that I ought to have enough spiritual sense to understand that there is, there is no uh, sense even asking you know, God to give life, that same quality of life, to that person who is sinning unto death. So, I'd, I would put the prodigal son in the first half of the verse, and I'd, I'd put a Jezebel in the last half of the verse. I believe the text to be saying that you have a lot of confidence in the Lord, and that your confidence that you have is also the confidence of your brother. And when you see him sin a sin, you know that you have 
you're mature enough, you know that you have enough spiritual integrity, enough intelligence, enough, enough maturity, enough understanding to know that that sin is not one that leads to an ultimate separation from God, but it may be bothering the one that you see sinning, a, that sin un, that's not unto death. They don't quite understand that that is a sin that is not under death, unto death, but you do. So you pray about it, and God gives that person that is sinning the sin that is your brother that's sinning peace. God gives life to them who are doing the sinning. I believe that the Holy Spirit is saying, I want you to leave here with comfort, not a burden, you know, every message that I've heard on this text would leave us burdened about the way that we live so that we can't have any peace or rest or joy. And I don't want that. I want you to realize that Jesus Christ died in your place. You have absolute confidence in Him. And I do not think folks suddenly in the midst of knowing, 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 having confidence, having boldness, all of a sudden you ought to be terrified by this verse like you know you better be careful man you you might fall away you may go to hell the passage that i opened up this video with in reading in hebrews chapter 6 is someone that i believe fits the latter part of this verse who is sinning unto death we folks are not sinning unto spiritual death it's a passage of comfort it looks to me like what I'm supposed to ask is, Lord, you know, this, this brother of mine who is sinning a sin that is not unto death needs to understand, have the life, the comfort, the peace, the joy of knowing that that sin is not going to separate him or lead to, lead to spiritual death. He's not, it's not going to separate him from God. That's what it says to me. There's a verse of scripture that's used in every seminary. You know, they say, don't move far from the normal path. And over the years, I've had trouble determining what the normal path is. I do not think that I'm alone in, in the, the, this interpretation of the text. You know, every once in a while, every great once in a while, I rejoice to find that occasionally, not very often, but occasionally, there's a brilliant mind out there somewhere that pops up someplace in the past who agreed with something I said. And, well, I hope you laughed at that. Please go forth rejoicing, resting, glorifying in what God has done for you, praising His name because you love Him. Because you love Him, you live for Him. Because you love Him, you keep His commandments. You don't keep them because you fear Him. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.